It's not unusual for criminal defendants not to tell their attorneys the whole story. I mean, we always just operated on the information we had. I don't think that we ever were under the illusion that we had, you know, the complete truth. Because Mike just, the authorities were the enemy. You know, he did not cooperate with the authorities. He did not see himself as a snitch. I don't think he had ever ratted out anybody. And I, I was shocked that he would do that. You know, at that point, it was just a whole new ball game. I'm Jed Lipinski. This is Gone South. Episode 8, The Whole Story. We in the FBI, and me in particular, decided the only way we would ever get to the bottom of these murders would be to flip an insider. And we targeted the insider as being Mike Gillich. We knew Mike would know everything. We knew if we could break him, we could probably get the whole story. For Special Agent Keith Bell, the first step was convicting Mike of conspiring to kill the Sherrys in 91. Step two was the marijuana smuggling conviction in 92. Step three was placing Mike, who had lived in Biloxi all his life, in a federal prison in Schuylkill County, Pennsylvania. The Bureau of Prisons, of course, makes the final decision, but we wanted something with a little snow and... Uh, a long way from the Mississippi Gulf Coast, a long way from family and friends. So his visitation would be very limited. And when he looked out the window, he might see snow instead of uh, the Gulf of Mexico. In Schuylkill, Mike hired two well-respected criminal defense attorneys from Gulfport, a couple named Gail and Chet Nicholson, to file an appeal. We spent months on that uh, appellate brief, and I think the Fifth Circuit ruled on it in about two weeks. It seems like it was very short fuse. We, we wondered how carefully they had read it before they denied any relief. Gail said Mike was distraught by the denied appeal. The prospect of spending the rest of his life in a prison in the heart of Pennsylvania coal country filled him with despair. And I think that's when they started looking at some kind of collateral attack, which was how the witness tampering stuff evolved. In the summer of 1993, less than a year after Mike was put away, Keith got a tip from an intelligence specialist at the Bureau of Prisons. He was making a lot of phone calls and, and talking in language that was not normal, as if he was trying to conceal something. So Keith ordered tape recordings of Mike's prison phone calls. He spent hours listening to them at the FBI's resident agency in Gulfport. I soon determined that he was trying to arrange a way to get out of prison by tampering with one of my federal witnesses that had testified against him previously. And basically, the plan he had come up with, with some assistance from friends and relatives in Biloxi, was to pay the federal witness $20,000 and have him recant his testimony against Mike Gillich and say that Special Agent Keith Bell of the FBI had forced and threatened the the witness to lie. Keith identified the witness as Robbie Gant, a plumber in Carthage, Mississippi, who had testified in the 1991 trial to delivering $1,000 worth of scam money to Mike Gillich at the Golden Nugget. Keith made contact with him, and Gant agreed to cooperate. Not long after, Mike's plan went into motion. O.C. Anderson, one of Mike's Confederates, approached Gant at his house. He offered to pay him $20,000 in exchange for signing an affidavit that said Keith Bell had forced him to lie about delivering scam money to Mike. He didn't know that Gant was wearing a wire. We had the federal witness record everything, We had him what we call wired up by an FBI agent. 
And so we then had proof. And we had a copy of the affidavit also, as I recall, from the witness. And with that information and some other investigation, we indicted Gillich again on basically obstruction of justice and witness tampering. The indictment, filed in May of 1993, also charged O.C. Anderson and Frances Salisbury, Mike's longtime girlfriend, who had made copies of the fake affidavit to present in court. Around the time of the indictment, Robert Horensky was working as a legal extern at the U.S. Attorney's Office for the Southern District of Mississippi. As you may recall from earlier episodes, Robert's mother, Diane, was close to Margaret Sherry, and he was deeply familiar with the murder case. For this reason, Prosecutor James Tucker had asked him to assist in the new witness tampering case against Mike Gillich. My first assignment was that James Tucker told me, I want you to sit there and go through all the recordings and listen to every one of them because you're going to go to trial with us on the case. And I was like, oh, wow. (laughs) And so I sat there for days listening to all the recordings from the jail between Mike Gillich and whoever he called. Mike knew his phone calls were being recorded, but he was desperate and he may have assumed he could beat the system. There's actually a little uh, waiver that you sign when you are taken into federal prison that tells you all of your phone calls are recorded. But what Mike Gillich believed, and I know this from listening to him talk about it on audio recordings, was that those microphones were turned on and off at different times. And he thought that he could tell by little clicks in the phone when the, when the recording was on and when it was off. So he proceeded to talk to Francis Salisbury about getting this fake affidavit and trying to set up to get his conviction overturned. The phone calls mostly consisted of Mike plotting with Anderson and Salisbury to get Robbie Gant to recant his testimony. But the calls also featured conversations of a different kind. Then there was also the phone sex uh, that I had to listen to. That was not the fun part of the job. According to Robert, Mike and Francis repeatedly engaged in phone sex while Mike was locked up. Francis used to be married to Hatchet Henry Salisbury, the convicted murderer who had once made saddles for young Kirksey Nix in an Oklahoma prison. After Henry died of cancer in 1984, Francis took up with Mike who was married at the time, and went to work as a dancer in his strip clubs. As Robert listened to the tapes, he realized Mike and Francis would have phone sex and discuss bribing a federal witness in the same conversation. Which, according to Robert, meant the entire tape was admissible in court. In addition to everything that Mike Gillich had stacked against him in this trial, If you would, the cherry on top of the government's case was his wife was going to have to sit there in the courtroom and listen to at least some of the phone sex conversations that he's having with his girlfriend from prison. If Mike went to trial and lost, he faced an additional 10 to 15 years on top of the 20 years he'd already received. Yet, in the summer of 1993, Mike pleaded not guilty. A trial was scheduled for the fall. As the trial date approached, however, Mike's resolve collapsed. And when it came time to start the trial, Mike Gillich's attorney, Chet Nicholson, came to me at the prosecutor's table uh, in the U.S. courthouse in Hattiesburg where the trial was about to commence and said, basically, Mike Gillich has had enough. He doesn't need any more federal time. He knows you've got the tape recordings of his conversations. Some of his friends are at risk, and maybe some relatives are at risk of being prosecuted. So Mike Gillich is ready to cooperate and tell the whole story, quote, A to Z, A to Z. Mike's attorney, Gail Nicholson, remembers the moment Mike agreed to solve the Sherry murders. I think Chad and I looked at each other like, oh, boy, here we go, you know. <laughs> and then we we asked him, 
what can you tell them? What can you tell them? You know, who, can you tell them who the hitman was? Tell me the hitman wasn't you. And, you know, just kind of getting a handful of things that we knew that they would be important to them. And, and he said, yes, yeah, so I can do that. I can do that. And so we just kind of changed tracks. <laughs> Mike had several motives to solve the murders for the government. But Gail Nicholson said the prospect of his girlfriend, Francis, doing prison time was too much to bear. You know, having that many years looking at him, he surely was desperate to find a, a way out. But I, I'm not sure he would have ever cooperated but for them indicting Francis. And I think that indicting Francis really made him understand that he was going to have to do something dramatic to save her. And I think that's what he did. In response to Mike's statement, the trial was postponed, allowing the government time to check Mike's story out. The government was puzzled by Mike's initial statement. Speaking to Keith Bell and prosecutors, he claimed that Vince Sherry was killed not because of missing scam money, but because Vince had said insulting things about Mike's friends and family, including Francis, whom Vince had allegedly called a whore. Mike said he was also upset that Vince had taken a circuit court judgeship that was supposed to go to his son-in-law. This marked a strange turn of events, as Keith Bell knew that Vince and Mike had once been close. Vince had for years represented dancers at Gillich's Golden Nugget Strip Club, and the two were often seen drinking coffee together at the Krispy Kreme donut shop across the street. But by 1985, Mike said he was ready to kill Vince for disrespecting him. He later testified that he called Kirksey Nix at Angola and asked if Kirksey knew anyone who could take Vince out. According to Mike, Kirksey replied, Whatever you want to do, Dad, I'm with you. But Keith, having spent six years on the Sherry case, suspected Mike was holding back. When they gave Mike a polygraph test, it came back inconclusive. When Keith questioned Mike again later that month, Mike stood by his earlier story. But this time, he offered more details. He claimed LeRae Sharp had delivered the murder weapon to him at the Golden Nugget months before the Sherrys were killed. He even provided the identity of the trigger man, Thomas Leslie Holcomb. Gillich went on to say that John Ransom, who most still believed was the hitman, had backed out after his would-be getaway driver, Bill Rhodes, got busted for bank robbery. After that, Mike said he struggled to find a replacement hitman. They actually interviewed several other Dixie Mafia hitmen trying to find someone that would be willing to kill a judge, but no one would take up Gillich. Then, in the summer of 1987, Mike Gillich's friend Glenn Cook, a former Biloxi cop who used to manage Mike's strip clubs, recommended his friend Thomas Holcomb. Who both Gillich and Cook had known for years. Holcomb had been a traveling carnival worker and had come to the Mississippi Gulf Coast with the traveling carnival for many years. Cook actually knew Holcomb better than Gillich did. According to Mike, Glenn convinced Holcomb to drive to Biloxi to discuss the hit on Vince Sherry. He did come over in the summer of 1987, and Gillich offered Holcomb about $10,000 if he would kill Judge Sherry. Holcomb thought about it briefly, and he declined uh, the offer. But later that summer, perhaps in late August, early September, Gillich upped his offer to $20,000. I believe they felt Holcomb was perhaps their last best chance to find a hitman that would be willing to kill a judge. And with that, uh, Holcomb agreed to, to go forward with killing the judge. Keith believed Mike's story about Thomas Holcomb but he did not believe Mike's statement that Kirksey Nix and Pete Hallett were not involved. He knew Mike was close to both of them. In fact, Kirksey's wife, Kelly Don Nix, had told Keith that Mike had become a kind of father figure to Kirksey after his own father died in the late 70s. Pete, for his part, had admitted to being friends with Gillich since the early 70s. The two had grown up in Biloxi's working-class Point Cadet neighborhood. As a young county court judge, 
Pete had expunged Mike's gambling record in 1976. And during Pete's years as mayor, Mike had run his strip clubs without any arrests. At their next interview, under pressure from Keith, Mike revealed more. He admitted to discussing the plot to kill Vince Sherry with Kirksey. He also admitted to warning Pete that if Vince didn't stop bad rapping him and his family, he would have Vince killed. Mike then submitted to a second polygraph exam. When the examiner asked Mike whether Pete was, quote, knowingly and actively involved in the Sherry's deaths, Mike replied, no. The test indicated he was lying. Experts question the reliability of polygraph exams, and courts have traditionally not allowed test results into evidence at trial. Keith had used them many times before and found them a helpful investigative tool. Based on hundreds of interviews and years of investigation, Keith strongly suspected Mike was still holding back. So, shortly after failing his second polygraph, Keith pushed Mike again to give him the full story. It was then, according to FBI records, that Mike, quote, made a full and complete confession as to the actual criminal involvement of Pete Hallett and Kirksey McCord Nix in the plot to kill the Sherrys. Keith Bell said Mike Gillich's reluctance to implicate Pete and Kirksey in a murder conspiracy was to be expected. It is not uncommon for somebody like Mike Gillich, a lifelong criminal, to deny everything, to continue to deny everything, and hopefully deny forever until they're faced with uh, solid facts and other witnesses and other evidence. So what Gillich did is just straight out of the playbook for criminals as far as trying to lie initially, then eventually, hopefully, you tell the truth. And in his case, I think he did tell the truth. Well, Pete, uh, I don't know if he called me or come by the, by, by the club or the house or whatever, but he told me he was going, he was going to go to Angola to see Curtsy, and he asked me did I want to ride up there with him. This is the voice of Mike Gillich. Mike died in 2012, but in May of 2001, he granted a series of recorded interviews to his attorney, Chet Nicholson. Okay, Mike, we were talking. You, you went up to Angola to meet with uh, Kirksey. You went up there with Pete. Yeah. On here. In the recordings, Mike recounted in great detail his involvement in the Sherry murders and the role that Kirksey Nix and Pete Hallett allegedly played. As Mike told Keith, Pete had come to him in early December of 1986 with a problem. He said that, that he had a problem. You know, and he needed to go see Curtis, you know, and would I go up there with him, you know? And I told him, I said, yeah, I said, you know, I'll go with you, you know, well, what's your problem? And he said, well, he says, uh, he said, there's some money missing of Curtis's. And I said, what do you mean some money missing the currency? See, I didn't even know Pete was holding money of uh, was currency, you know what I'm saying? And I said, how much money are you talking about or what, you know? And he said, well, he said, $100,000. I said, $100,000? He said, yeah. I said, well, Pete, where in the hell was this money? And he told me, he said that he had a stash in his office. And he said, only him and Vince knew this money was there. You know, and he said he didn't take it. So that's putting the thing at, at Vince. Mm-hmm. You know, and he wanted me to go over there with Tracy when, when he when explained this, you know. Mike's story bore a striking resemblance to the story Bobby Joe Fabian had told authorities years earlier. According to Mike, Pete claimed to be holding proceeds from Kirksey's prison scam, which Kirksey intended to use to buy his way out of prison. The only people who knew about this secret stash were Pete and Vince. But then, Kirksey had suddenly requested some of the money, and Pete was forced to admit that $100,000 of it was missing. Pete told Mike he didn't take it, so it must have been Vince. A few days later, on December 8, 1986, Pete and Mike made the four-hour drive from Biloxi to Angola to explain the situation to Kirksey. During the trip, Mike said, Pete spoke openly about the mechanics of the scam. As Mike recalled, 
Pete had been aware of it from the start. Like I say, when, when we went to go see him that time, well, Pete's telling me about it about the scam and the lonely hearts and all that, you know, that they making this money, you know what I'm saying. When did you realize that, that Pete and Vince Sherry knew about that stuff? Well, uh, from day one, I guess. You know, because Pete talked about it, you know, making that money scamming and all that, you know. And then, hey, that's why, you know, Pete represented them too, <laughs> you know. You know, you got paid. Pete's intention, Mike said, was to bring him into the meeting with Kirksey to help Pete explain that Vince had taken the $100,000, not him. And that's why he wanted me to be with him, you know, you know, talk to Kirksey too, you know, like, like it ain't him, you know, it's it's Vince. Once they arrived at the prison, however, Pete's plan hit a snag. Anyhow, we went on up there and, uh, and, and met with Kirksey. Pete signed in and signed me in as, a, as an investigator. On a previous trip Pete and Mike made to Angola to see Kirksey, Mike said, Pete had gotten him inside by calling him a private investigator. On this trip, however, Mike was asked to present his private eye credentials, which of course he didn't have. So, according to Mike, he wasn't allowed in. But when we got to Angola that time, uh, Pete couldn't bring me in. The deputy warden uh, wouldn't allow it. So I had to sit at the gates. And then Pete went on and visited with Tracy and come back. As Mike told his story about the trip to Angola, Keith was reminded of his former partner Randy Cook's trip to the prison four years earlier, an effort to fact-check Bobby Joe Fabian's televised interview. Examining the visitation logs, Randy had seen just what Mike described, a notation stating that Mike was denied access because he was not a private detective. As a result, Pete had apparently met with Kirksey alone for an hour and 25 minutes. Randy had wondered what the two of them discussed. Now, speaking to Keith Bell, Mike answered the question. Pete had blamed Vince for stealing the $100,000, and Kirksey was not happy. Kirksey told him, he said, you know, that uh, he'd better get his money back, and if Vince took it or whoever took it, better you know, get it back, or he could do somebody in, you know, I mean, kill him, you know. And like I told Pete, I said, well, if he, that's what he told you, you know, that, that's what he means, you know. And of course, Pete, you know, was kind of shook up, you know what I'm saying. Mm-hmm. According to Mike, Kirksey called him the next day at the Golden Nugget. He wanted to know who Mike thought really stole the money, Vince or Pete. Well, he asked me, you know, did I think, you know, that uh, Vince took it or that Pete took it or what, you know. And like I told him at the time, you know. I, you know, I really don't know, you know, see? and uh, but but if, if that's the way it is, one of them took it. You know, if, if they're the only two that knew about it, you know. See? Mike later testified that he told Kirksey Vince had probably stolen the money. Of course, Mike was not a neutral party. Prior to the missing money, Mike said he'd wanted to kill Vince himself. With Vince, I mean, I was ready to do him in myself, you know, see? Personal reasons, man. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, 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 you know. And then, then when I was talking to Kirsty on the phone, he said he was ready to move on him, you know, do something to him, you know. And he'd become convinced that it was Vince. And yeah, that, 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 yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, you know. And then you know, I said, well, okay, then, you know. I said, we'll just go ahead and uh, and get it on together, you know. And I said, you know, see what, what we do it for. Mike told Keith Bell that he and Kirksey continued talking about the potential hit on Vince into early 1987. By that spring, Mike said, it was clear Kirksey was not going to get his money back. Thus, Kirksey deputized Mike to find a hitman. Mike said he and Glenn Cook spent several months interviewing potential candidates before settling on Thomas Holcomb. It's unclear from Mike how much, if anything, Pete knew about the hitman interviews. But in early September of 1987, mere days before the hit was scheduled to go down, Mike claimed Pete stopped by one of his strip clubs to ask where things stood. You know, he he, he was kind of nervous about it. He come by by the old bingo hall. Francis was there, and uh, I said he wanted to know what was going on. You know, things. I said, well, I said everything's in in motion now. I said, you know, the, the hit is on. You know, and uh, I said he got somebody to do it, and uh, he wanted to know who it was, and I. Said, so, well, I don't think you know him, you know. And, uh, he made the crack too. Well, uh, tell Casey that, uh, that I'll pay half of it. 
For Keith Bell, this was perhaps the most disturbing detail of Mike's story. Mike was claiming that Pete, a week or so before the murders, had offered to pay half of the $20,000 fee to Thomas Holcomb to kill his friend and former law partner. In court testimony, Mike described Pete nervously rolling billiard balls up and down the strip club's pool table as they talked. Pete's chief concern, Mike said, was that Kirksey believed Pete had stolen the money, not Vince, and that he would be killed instead. Mike assured him that was not the case. Still, Pete fretted that the hitman might somehow mistake Vince for him. And he says, uh, well, they know the difference between uh, uh, Vince and, and him, you know. He said he'd hate to see him, you know, get the wrong guy, you know, and the joke being on him. I said, no, Pete, they know. They know it's, uh, you know, who's who, you know. A few days later, with the murder plot well underway, Mike claimed that he called Pete to ask if Vince and Margaret lived alone. Pete allegedly told him that their youngest daughter, Leslie, technically still lived there, but she was off at college. She would not be home. Shortly before the killings, Mike said, Glenn Cook test-fired the silencer equipped 22 into the floor of his house. Thomas Holcomb later test-fired it again into the floor of locksmith Lenny Sweatman's place, he said. Then, around 10 p.m. on the night of September 14, 1987, Mike said Thomas Holcomb drove a stolen yellow Ford Fairmont sedan to the Sherry's home in Ancient Oaks, alone. Mike had instructed him to shave and wear a suit and tie, and to introduce himself as a friend of Louis Ferranda, a former Biloxi cop and longtime friend of Vincent Margaret's, who had moved to Las Vegas. Tell him that, you know, you're from Vegas and you have a message uh, from, from Lewis. And I said, I'm sure, you know, they'll let you, let you in the house, you know. And that, that's, that's, that's how he got in the house. Okay. You know. Mike said he was at the Golden Nugget at the time the murders took place. Glenn Cook spoke to Holcomb the next day, he said, and learned that the job was done. And then Glenn called him a second time. And I uh, said, uh, he went on in, you know, and he did his business, you know, and, uh, and said uh, he threw her in for nothing. You know, it's just like that, you know. Until now, Keith had suspected that Margaret was also a target, a suspicion many in Biloxi shared. As a city councilwoman and mayoral candidate, she had railed against the incursion of casino gambling and the continued operation of Mike Gillich's strip clubs. The Sherry children had speculated that Pete wanted her out of the way to fulfill his own political ambitions. But now, Mike was claiming that Margaret's death was simply collateral damage, something the hitman did for free. Through his conversations with Glenn Cook, Mike said he learned that Holcomb had shot the Sherrys with a 22 and then driven to the nearby Gulf View apartments, where he exchanged the Ford Fairmont for his own Dodge pickup. He then drove straight back to his home in Evadale, Texas. While passing through Slidell, Louisiana, en route, Mike said, he had thrown the murder weapon off the twin span bridge into the middle of Lake Pontchartrain. Two days later, Pete discovered the bodies, stunning the city of Biloxi. That same afternoon, Mike said, Kirksey called him on a private line he kept at a video store next to the Golden Nugget. Uh, he called the, uh, the video store and told me, hey, Daddy, what's going on? He says, I understand uh, Vince and, uh, and, and his wife, and, you know, somebody down the middle or whatever. I said, yeah, that's what I understand too, you know. In the immediate aftermath of the murders, Mike said, Pete continued to check in with him. Oh, just about dark, I went out to his house. And uh, when I pulled up in the backyard there, he'd come on out he said, I ain't got nothing to worry about, huh? <laughs> I said, no, Pete, you ain't got nothing to worry about. Hey, you know, everything's all right now, you know. He said, well, he said, man, he said, okay, you know. He said, and that was, uh, that was our last conversation on that then, you know. In February of 1994, in response to Mike's statement, the feds dismissed the new charges against him without prejudice, meaning they reserved the right to try the case at a later date. Keith was confident Mike was telling the truth, but he wasn't about to take Mike's word for it. If his story were true, that meant Mike had lied under oath in both the 91 and 92 trials. And then, 
having agreed to cooperate with the feds prior to the 1993 witness tampering trial, Mike had lied several more times before settling on this final version. But that's why we go the extra step, as I did. That was in 93 when Gillich flipped. We didn't run out the next uh, month to the grand jury and indict. Knowing Mike's story would be the centerpiece of the government's case, Keith Bell spent the majority of the next three years attempting to corroborate every single element of what he said. It was a monumental task, but one that Keith Bell was particularly suited to. Okay, uh, I've always been somewhat uh, of an OCD type person. In other words, I want everything in its place. I want everything exact. And um, that turned out to be very helpful to me as an FBI agent. It perhaps slowed me down some in certain cases, but uh, it produced results eventually. Mike's Thomas Holcomb story turned out to be relatively easy to corroborate. As Mike himself admitted, Holcomb was not a smart man. He left a trail of evidence. When Keith subpoenaed phone records for Glenn Cook and Thomas Holcomb, they revealed that both men were in regular contact in the months and weeks before the murders. We found a, uh, what we call a toll record, where uh, on August 22, 1987, about three weeks before the Sherrys were killed, a call was made from Holcomb's house in Evadale, Texas, to Glenn Cook's house in Biloxi. We also developed information through an informant that Holcomb had been back over in Biloxi in 1991 and had bragged to an informant that it only took him three minutes to kill the Sherry's and exit the house. So, of course, that was of tremendous interest. Keith even managed to confirm that Glenn Cook had indeed test-fired the silencer equipped 22 into the floorboards of his house before the killings. When we first found out about the test firing from Mike Gillich, we got a search warrant, we crawled under this house on East Howard, and we could tell that uh, an entire bedroom floor had been replaced. Keith tracked down the carpenter who replaced the floor, a man named Oscar Noble. Oscar noted that the house's owner, Glenn Cook, had carved out a small section of the floorboards before asking Oscar to replace the entire thing, citing termite damage. And when asked about termite damage anywhere else, he said he didn't see any termite damage anywhere in the house. Keith didn't stop there. He suspected the test-fired bullets were still in the ground beneath Glenn Cook and Lenny Sweatman's houses. After obtaining search warrants, he recruited two National Guardsmen from Hattiesburg to bring metal detectors to Biloxi. I had them scan the ground under both locations, and uh, 22 caliber projectiles were found at uh, both locations. Corroborating Mike's statements about Pete proved more challenging. In his initial statement to Captain Randy Cook, Bobby Joe Fabian warned it would be hard to prove any scam money had in fact gone missing. As Bobby Joe put it, they covered their ass pretty good. In his conversations with Keith Bell, Mike Gillich echoed that sentiment. In the 1991 trial, only one person had admitted to delivering scam money to Pete Hallett, and for only $300. But Mike said Pete was too smart to take scam money from just anyone. He assumed any scam money Pete received was delivered to him solely by Larray Sharp, Kirksey's girlfriend and confidant, who was working in Pete's law office. During his investigation, Keith told me that numerous sources and informants had told him that Pete was holding scam money in a safe deposit box in Biloxi. So Keith subpoenaed Pete's bank records. To his surprise, they showed that Pete and Larray had shared access to a safe deposit box at Jefferson Bank in downtown Biloxi. The bank sat across the street from the Hallett Sherry Law Office. Investigation eventually determined that Pete Hallett had opened a safe deposit box around September of 85 with LaRay Sharp 
and records indicated that both Pete and LeRae uh, made numerous entries uh, into that safe deposit box in Biloxi. According to the records, LeRae Sharp first accessed the box on September 9th, 1985. Over the next eight months, she opened it 22 times, or about three times per month. But in April of 1986, sources told Keith, she and Kirksey apparently had a falling out, and Kirksey ordered Pete to take away her key. Until that point, records show that Pete visited the safe deposit box only a few times. But after LeRae was removed from the account, Pete started making frequent trips. He visited the box 10 times between April and December of 1986, the same month that Pete allegedly told Mike Gillich that $100,000 in scam money had gone missing. Mike's story now began to make more sense. Keith speculated that once LeRae's key was taken, Pete immediately began skimming from Kirksey's buyout money. And Pete was caught unawares when Kirksey requested that the money be moved. At some point, according to our investigation, Kirksey Nix called Pete Halat and requested the money be sent to a bank in New Orleans. And, uh, of course, by then, allegedly, there was little to no money left, which created uh, quite a circumstance for uh, Mr. Halat. But Pete's bank records also revealed something else. In early January of 1987, a month after Pete and Mike traveled to Angola, allegedly to inform Kirksey about the missing money, Pete closed the safe deposit box that he'd shared with LeRae Sharp. He then opened a new one. And this one had Vince Sherry's name on it. And yet, it appeared that Vince had never accessed the box prior to his death. Vince, according to the records, Vince never visited that safe deposit box but Pete Hallatt did. Lynn Spazito, as the administrator of her parents' estate, had gotten access to the same bank records Keith Bell examined. Lynn, too, found it strange that Vince had never accessed the safe deposit box at Jefferson Bank. But she had a theory as to why. As she later told Keith, Vince's signature on the rental agreement appeared to be forged. The handwriting was far too neat, she said and her father had always signed important documents Vincent J. Sherry Jr., not simply Vincent Sherry, as the rental agreement showed. At one point, Lynn sent me a photograph of what she said was her father's signature, and she was right. They didn't match. Keith drew a few conclusions from his inspection of Pete's bank records. One, he assumed that Vince never knew his name had been added to the account. Two, Keith suspected Pete had added Vince's name himself. By doing so, Keith believed that he was creating a paper trail to make it seem plausible that Vince had stolen Kirksey's buyout money. In October 1996, based primarily on Mike Gillich's statement and Keith Bell's subsequent investigation, the prosecutors drafted an indictment. The hesitation Keith encountered back in 1991 was gone. The grand jury returned the indictment but it remained under seal. It accused Pete Hallett, along with Kirksey Nix, Glenn Cook, and Thomas Holcomb, of running a criminal enterprise that resulted in the deaths of Vince and Margaret Sherry. Pete was specifically accused of helping to arrange and pay for the slayings. LeRae Sharp was also charged with obstructing justice for giving false testimony at the 1991 trial. By this point, the feds had known that Thomas Holcomb was the man who killed the Sherrys for more than two years, but they had kept it a secret. Before the indictment was unsealed, the FBI issued a warrant for his arrest. So we decided that we better locate Holcomb and get him in custody because if he hears about these indictments, he may go what we call in the wind and we may never find him. The arrest warrant was forwarded out to the Houston area, which covered all the cities where Holcomb had been known to previously live. It was a Friday night, and I was at a high school football game, and I received a call from my supervisor at the time telling me that a lead was coming in from the Jackson Division, Gulfport Resident Agency, regarding a Dixie Mafia investigation. 
This is Bruce Marshall, a former agent for the FBI's Houston Division. I had never heard of the Dixie Mafia at that time, but the, the lead was regarding a sealed indictment of several individuals, including the hitman. His name was Thomas Leslie Holcomb, responsible for the killing of Circuit Judge Vincent Sherry and his wife, Margaret. So we knew right away that, you know, he was a dangerous individual. The information had that he was possibly working uh, at a carnival somewhere in the Houston area. Bruce soon determined that the Katy Rice Festival, located in a Houston suburb, was in the process of setting up. It was not completely set up. It had not started yet, so we caught it without the public being there. We took the picture that we had of Mr. Holcomb and showed it to the carnival owner, and he identified him as one of the employees working there at a particular booth. Early the next morning, Bruce and two other agents positioned themselves near the carnival entrance and waited for Holcomb's vehicle to pull in. Mr. Holcomb, we could recognize him, got out of his car, went into the convenience store, bought coffee, and then walked towards his booth. Agent Binding was at one end of the sidewalk. Agent Hersom was on another side, and I was on a different side as well. Once he was identified, we waited till he got on the sidewalk. Agent Binding was coming from the front. Agent Hersom and I met behind him, and probably about 10 yards from him, drew our service weapons and called his name. You know, he turned around and looked at us, and it was just almost like expressionless. And I think he knew at that time that, that you know, the gig was up. Took custody of him, handcuffed him. No screaming, no yelling, no fight, no struggle. He went, you know, peacefully. Bruce immediately called Keith Bell to let him know that Holcomb had been arrested without incident. He was waiting for the arrest so that once the indictment was unsealed, the other defendants could be arrested as well. Keith Bell had long believed that Georgia hitman John Ransom could not have killed the Sherrys because he bore no resemblance to the man the Sherrys' neighbor had seen outside the house the night of the murder. When Keith finally saw Thomas Holcomb's mugshot, he said, the resemblance was uncanny. The shooter had finally been captured. It was now time for a trial. When the indictments were finally unsealed, the allegation that Pete Hallett had played a lead role in planning the Sherry killings electrified the press across the Gulf Coast. David Chesnoff, a Las Vegas defense attorney who took Pete's case, decried the charges against him as, quote, typical of Washington policy, which is to make deals with the most horrible people in the world to hurt people who aren't horrible. Chesnoff and Pete had met some years earlier when they both represented defendants in an organized crime case in Biloxi. Chesnoff was a formidable trial lawyer whose client list included major crime figures and celebrities. I've represented the uh, alleged largest heroin dealer in the history of the West Coast and got a not guilty. I represented the defendant in the largest cocaine seizure in the history of the United States and hung the jury. And then, uh, of course, I'm based in Las Vegas, so I've represented a lot of well-known people. Um, I represented Mike Tyson and Martha Stewart, all sorts of celebrities from Britney Spears to Paris Hilton. Despite his blue-chip clientele, Chesnoff considered himself a defender of the underdog. He said he believed Pete was innocent of the charges. I was a believer in his innocence. I thought he was a very sincere guy. Um, I loved his family, his wife and his daughter. And Pete was beloved by people. I mean, you couldn't go anywhere with Pete Hallett in that area and not have people uh, hugging him, glad-handing him. He was just an impressive guy to me. The trial began in June of 1997 in Hattiesburg, nearly 10 years after the murders. Judge Charles Pickering, who'd presided over the 91 and 92 trials, presided over this one as well. 
The defense's case rested on the idea that the government's key witness was a lifelong criminal who'd lied repeatedly under oath and was cooperating to cut his prison time. I certainly think that it's obviously self-preservation, uh, which is what all these people that decide to become rats do. Ultimately, rather than taking it on the chin, they decide that the best way to get out of trouble is to make it somebody else's problem. He, he obviously was considered a liar by the government because they believed him in spite of the fact that he had previously said other things. So basically the government was putting someone they knew to be a perjurer as the person who was going to solve the crime. LeRae Sharp, for her part, suspected the government had pressured Mike to put Pete into the conspiracy because that's what she claimed they did to her. They questioned me dozens of times. I got questioned by Louisiana State Police, Louisiana FBI, Mississippi State Police, Mississippi FBI. They made my life a living hell. I couldn't even work and hold the job. They offered me witness protection. They offered to move me to another state and change my name to say things about Pete. We just want Pete. Just give us Pete. Give us Pete and we'll expunge all these things. Give us Pete and we'll wipe this out of your record. Just give us Pete. They told me I was going to spend the rest of my life in prison if I didn't cooperate and give them Pete. You know what I said to them? I don't care what you're going to offer me. I'm going to tell the truth. I'm not going to throw Pete under the bus or lie about Pete. I'm not about to lie and send an innocent man to prison because I would not get over it. I would not sleep at night. This man didn't do anything that I'm aware of. LeRae's accusations amount to what is known as suborning perjury, a federal crime in which a witness is induced to lie under oath. In interviews with me, Keith Bell and other federal prosecutors denied ever having pressured LeRae, Mike Gillich, or other witnesses into making false statements about Pete Hallett. There is no doubt in my mind that everything we did was legitimate 100 percent. No prosecutor, and not me, would ever try to convict anybody that was not guilty. Kirksey Nix did not testify at the 97 trial, but his attorney argued that the government had become stuck to Bobby Joe Fabian's story eight years earlier and couldn't get unstuck despite the fact that Bobby Joe's story had been discredited by multiple witnesses. Keith Bell realized that Fabian's been taking him for the ride. That it's just a mixture of uh, some facts and lies. Yet, they still want to stick to the missing money story. But, but the point is, they couldn't let go of that, and, and they still haven't let go of it, because they don't want to admit they made mistakes that they got swindled by Bobby Fabian. Kirksey said he was stunned to learn that Mike had implicated him and Pete in the murder conspiracy. He stressed that in Mike's initial statements to Keith Bell, Mike had indicated that he and Pete were not involved. I was really shocked. I, uh, I just didn't think that he would do something like that, and I didn't think that he would lie about it. But, you know, he tried to tell the truth. He told him that I wasn't involved, Pete Howlett wasn't involved, and they didn't want to hear that because they had already accused Pete Howlett. They had already gone on this missing money trip. I thought I'd pull Mike into all of this due to my scams and him holding some of my money, when in fact he, he pulled Pete into this, me into that. During the trial, Chesnoff made it crystal clear that the government had no hard evidence that Pete had ever held or stolen Kirksey Nix's scam money. Gillich did, did say that, but it was completely inconsistent with the evidence. There was no sign that Pete had had large sums of unexplained money, that he had expensive cars, had bought real estate. None of the indicia of Pete having wealth that was inconsistent with the amount of money that Pete would have made as, as a lawyer. So... Gillich's representation that Pete took the money, as far as I was concerned, was completely uh, inconsistent with Pete's lifestyle. But as Keith Bell argued, hard evidence of missing money was one thing. Circumstantial evidence was another. 
And according to Keith, there was plenty of circumstantial evidence that Kirksey Nix's money had disappeared. LeRae's mother, Jan Jones, testifying for the defense, strongly implied that scam money was kept in a safe deposit box. The prosecution spent hours presenting detailed exhibits of Pete Hallett's bank records, showing his repeated visits to the safe deposit box in the months before he and Mike drove to Angola to see Kirksey. Pete's attorneys had advised him not to testify at trial because, as David Chesnoff said, the government had not proved their case beyond a reasonable doubt. It was not a difficult decision, he said. In interviews with us, Pete denied holding money for Kirksey in a safe deposit box at Jefferson Bank. But he did admit to using the box to store some of Kirksey's jewelry. Kirksey had a bunch of um, jewelry uh, that he wanted me to hold for him and a watch. And he said he wanted me to put them in a safe deposit box. So we put it in a safe deposit box for him. He paid for it. Never put any scam money in the safe deposit box. Pete dismissed the entirety of the government's case as the result of Mike Gillich's desire to get out of federal prison in Schuylkill, Pennsylvania. Mike Gillich wanted to get out of jail. Okay? During my trial in 1997, they played tapes of him talking on the telephone to his daughter. And he, he was crying like a baby. And he didn't want to die in prison and he wanted to come home. I believe they pressured Mike Gillis to the extent that he lied in this statement and on the witness stand. During one of our interviews in Biloxi, which his wife and daughter attended, I asked Pete what he perceived to be the motive for the murders. I think it was because he was he was angry with Vincent Margaret because of some alleged insults that Vincent made about his, his girlfriend, Frances, and uh, his daughter, Tina. The target was Vince, but then Margaret happened to be there, and she was just unlucky to be there, so Colcom shot her, too. Toward the end of the interview, I turned to the subject of Pete and Mike's visit to Angola on December 8, 1986. This, of course, was the meeting at which both Bobby Joe Fabian and Mike Gillich claimed Pete had told Kirksey that some of the money Kirksey amassed to pay his way out of prison was missing. Your version of the story, you travel with Mike to Angola, then what happens? There was never a discussion of missing scam money. Not with him, not with him and me and Kirksey Nix, not with me and him and anybody else. End of story. We got that last time. The question was, what happened once you guys arrive at Angola? We went through the normal process of uh, being checked in. We went to where Kirksey was. Kirksey came out. He says he'd rather speak with Mike Gillich alone. They went in the room. I sat outside about a half an hour later. Mike came out, Kirksey came out, we said goodbye, and we left. Got it. And what was the original reason for traveling all that way to Angola? It's a four-hour drive. It's a four-hour drive back. Mike Gillich asked me to come with him that, that uh, he needed to go talk to Junior. He called him Junior and asked me if I would go with him. And I said, fine, I'll go with you. I thought I'd... I, I thought I'd at least uh, say hello to Kirksey. <laughs> and Mike wanted me to go with him. He didn't want to go by himself. Mike, you know, Mike wasn't the bravest person around. And I, I think he was I think he was actually intimidated by uh by Kirksey and by by the prison, you know, by Angola. Angola is not a fun place to visit, by the way. I don't know if you've ever been there, but it's not a fun place to go to. And uh, I went with him. I asked Pete if Mike had told him what he and Kirksey talked about during their meeting. I, I have no idea what Mike discussed with Kirksey Nix. He, he didn't talk about it when we left. So we didn't talk about anything on the way back. I didn't ask him about it, to tell you the truth. But I can tell you for sure that we did not discuss missing scam money. Let's pause here for a moment. 
Having spent the better part of a year researching this story, the notion that Mike Gillich's bitterness toward Vince motivated the murders makes a certain amount of sense. Mike was clearly the prime mover in the murder plot. He admitted to providing the murder weapon, raising the money, and hiring the hitman. Pete, however, maintains to this day that he is completely innocent, that he had nothing to do with the scam and nothing to do with planning or conspiring with the planners of the Sherry murders. At the outset of our project, Pete's daughter, Brandon, had said to me in an email, I'm not seeking anything but his truth to be told. In telling Pete's story, I tried to honor her request. In my conversations with Pete, he seemed to have an answer for everything. Whether those answers were truthful is subject for debate, but I found his story about the December visit to Angola hard to accept. Despite almost overwhelming evidence to the contrary, Pete, a busy attorney who'd once described Kirksey as a pest client, insisted that he drove Mike Gillich to Angola on a Monday afternoon, only to sit outside while Mike met with Kirksey instead. Then, during the four-hour drive back to Biloxi with Mike, a man he'd been friends with for more than 20 years, Pete told me he did not even inquire what Mike and Kirksey had discussed. For years, prosecutors had pointed to this exact December meeting as perhaps the key moment in the Sherry murder saga, the catalyst that put everything into motion. At the 91 trial, under cross-examination by the government, Pete was asked about the meeting. Pete acknowledged that Mike Gillich had accompanied him that day to Angola. 35 years later, he told us the same story. But when the prosecutor asked if Mike Gillich had met with Kirksey, Pete told a different story. You had him with you on December 8, 1986, the prosecutor asked. But Mr. Gillich had to wait at the prison gate? Pete replied, that's correct. Pete, at age 80, has a remarkable recall for minute details of the Sherry case. What does it say that he has trouble remembering whether he was present for this pivotal meeting? It leads me to believe that Pete was not telling the truth. I think Pete did meet with Kirksey that day. But for whatever reason, he's incapable of admitting what they discussed, perhaps even to himself. The jury in the 97 trial appeared to share some of my suspicions about Pete Hallett's involvement in the murder conspiracy. On July 17th, after six days of deliberation, Pete was convicted of conspiracy to commit racketeering, obstruction of justice, conspiracy to obstruct justice, and conspiracy to commit wire fraud the charges carried a potential life sentence. Those charges may sound confusing, and trust me, they are. But in the opinion of his defense attorneys, Pete's conviction hinged on Judge Pickering's decision to issue something called the willful blindness instruction to jurors. So the uh, willful blindness instruction, or the ostrich instruction, meaning you put your head in the sand and look the other way, is a very powerful tool of the prosecution because basically, it's commenting on your silence. Chesnoff's co-counsel, Tommy Spina, described how it may have been applied in Pete's case. What it's telling the jury is, even though you don't think this guy intended for his law partner to be killed, and certainly not his wife, if he sort of looked the other way while others were planning that, then he might as well have been involved. It's just hard to overcome that instruction. In the end, Judge Pickering sentenced Pete to 18 years in federal prison. Kirksey and Thomas Holcomb each received life sentences, while Larray Sharp was given five years. Pickering then had to decide what to do about Mike Gillich. Prosecutors had pressured him to reduce Mike's sentence because of his cooperation, but Pickering had seen his prodigious rap sheet and he agonized over the decision. I told him that he was one of the most evil, wicked uh, criminals that had ever come before me, and it pained me greatly to have to uh, reduce his sentence. In fact, law enforcement had the impression that there wasn't any murder or any robbery that took place on the coast that he wasn't involved in one way or the other. And I think that his record pretty well bore that out. But when he came before me for the reduction of sentence, for the first time he showed humility. And he turned around to the Sherry children 
And he almost broke down and said, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Mike was released from prison in July of 2000, having served nine years of a 20-year sentence. In response to his confessions, his family abandoned him. He married his longtime girlfriend, Frances Salisbury, and according to his attorney, Gail Nicholson, he became a born-again Christian. When I first heard about the Dixie Mafia earlier this year, I half suspected it was a myth, as author Darlene Kern contended in her book about the group. Kirksey Nick still insists it was invented by law enforcement. But after decades spent fighting crime across the South, Keith Bell believes the Dixie Mafia was a real thing. It's just easy to describe these people as Dixie Mafia members, even though they're not carrying a membership card. But you can tell through the crimes and through the solutions of the crimes, you know, who's involved, who's associating, who helped plan, who traveled. And uh, there is a Dixie Mafia. There was a Dixie Mafia, in my opinion. Thomas Leslie Holcomb died in prison in 2005 after serving seven years of his life sentence. He was 52 years old. John Elbert Ransom was released from prison in 2003. He died three years later in his home state of Georgia at the age of 78. His obituary listed no survivors. Bobby Joe Fabian was finally transferred to the Mississippi State Penitentiary in 2009, but he was never released. He died of congestive heart failure in 2012 at the age of 66. Mike Gillich died of cancer in West Biloxi one month prior to Bobby Joe Fabian. And Kirksey Nix is incarcerated at a federal prison in El Reno, Oklahoma, serving a life sentence without possibility of parole. Pete Hallett served 15 years in federal prison and was released in 2013. So this is, uh, this is where you hang out? Yeah. You want to get a bite to eat or you want to drink yeah, or something? Yeah, like a quick bite. Well, come, on, come on, On our last day in Biloxi, we paid a visit to the Slavonian Lodge, a hulking colonnaded community center for men of Croatian descent. Don't be too concerned about what goes on. The building sits just blocks from where Pete grew up, in Biloxi's Point Cadet neighborhood. Pete has served as the lodge's president in the past, but on this night, he was acting as the bartender for a large, boisterous group of men who'd gathered for a weekly Thursday night dinner of pork and beans. He agreed to show us around. They they used to have a a, a water tower for for the air conditioner here. And that's why I, I climbed up on it and looked through this window when Elvis was playing in there. I was like I was like thirteen or fourteen years old. Elvis played in there. Yes, that's where he was, in there. Hanging on the wall was a map of the former Yugoslavia, where Pete's parents were born. I'm gonna show you where my folks come from. See that right there? That little inlet? It's a little town called Bobovishka, right above Milny. That's on the island of Brach in Croatia. They left from there to go to uh, Split over here on their way to uh, New York in 1903. Pete was in his element, surrounded by men he'd known for much of his life. Me? Yeah, they won't talk to you. Okay. Okay. Ask him anything you want. Uh, I don't want you to hear what I say. No, I'm just kidding. (laughs) At one point, Pete introduced us to an 88-year-old gentleman that everyone called Stag. We stepped into the banquet hall to talk, and he told us he'd been a member of the lodge since the 1950s. Yeah, well, Pete and I have been friends for a long time. He was president of the lodge, and we worked together. Being an attorney, he gave us a lot of advice and things that we had to do. Stagg says he was distraught when he learned Pete had been sentenced to 18 years in prison. I was shocked, as everybody else were, and uh, really didn't know what was going on. Nobody knew. And when he went through the courts and everything, and I was real upset about him getting so much time, you know. I asked him if he believed that Pete was complicit in the Sherry murders. You were never convinced that he was involved? No, no, I never was. And I'm not to the day, and I never, I never asked him, I never questioned him. I don't know of anybody that ever asked him. Might have had a few people in, in Lodge when Pete came back that, you know, said that, uh, we shouldn't be a member and stuff like that. But, you know, you serve your time, you did. 
what they ask you to do, and, and uh, he had a right to start his life over again. That's what I think. As we got ready to leave, we noticed a group of men sipping whiskey and playing cards in a small room behind the bar. Pete caught us staring at them and gently shut the door. He flashed a smile and said, you weren't supposed to see that. Thank you for listening to season two of Gone South, a creation and production of C13 Originals, a Cadence 13 studio. Executive produced by Chris Corcoran, chief content officer and founding partner of Cadence 13, along with Jed Lipinski, Tom Lipinski, and Ken Lee. Written and narrated by me, Jed Lipinski. Directed and produced by Lloyd Lockridge. Produced by Tom Lipinski. Edited by Alistair Sherman. Mixed and mastered by Chris Basil. Production support by Ian Mont, Margot Gray, Bill Schultz, Bob Tabador, and Sean Cherry. Original music written and performed by Casey Wayne McAllister. Artwork by Kurt Courtenay. Marketing, PR, sales and operations and business affairs by Maura Curran, Josefina Francis, Hilary Schuff, Lauren Vieira, Lucas Santroen, Lizzie Roberti, Danny Kutrick, and Karen Andrews. Cadence 13 is an Odyssey company.